For the Orthodox Christian Church, August 1st through the 15th marks the canonical Lent for the Dormition of the Theotokos, the God-bearer, the Mother of God. Joachim and Anna were righteous people who served God faithfully. They prayed earnestly, asking God to grant them a child. The community continuously mocked them for being barren. Finally, one day in her old age, Anna was praying in her garden and the Archangel Gabriel announced to her that she will bear a daughter most blessed by whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed and through whom will come the salvation of the world. Joachim and Anna each promised to have their child raised in the temple as a holy vessel of God. When Mary was three years old, Joachim and Anna took her to the temple and dedicated their child to God. She spent nine years in the temple. She was led to the holy place to become herself the holy of holies of God, the living sanctuary and the temple of the divine child who was to be born in her. Righteous Joachim and Anna visited Mary often at the temple until they died leaving her an orphan at the age of 10. When Mary was 12 years old, Zacharias the priest, father of John the Baptist, wanted to find a suitable man who could take care of her. He gathered the canes of her male relatives and put them in the temple. The next day, the cane of Joseph the carpenter budded, just like Aaron's rod in the Old Testament, and consequently, Mary and Joseph were betrothed. After the betrothal of the Virgin Mary to Joseph, the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and announced to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Her humility and dedication to the Lord is what allowed her to respond with, Behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. She conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. The church tradition maintains the veritable belief that she is ever virgin, even before, during, and after the birth of Christ. This is symbolized in the icons of St. Mary by three crosses, one on the cloth on her head and one on either side of her. It is stated in the prayers from Supper of Thursday that, If disputants ask you how Mary was conceived, answer them wisely. How do the trees conceive? The trees conceive from the breath of the winds, and Mary from the breath of the Holy Spirit. We remember her in almost all hours of the prayers, especially in Lilio prayers that contain the following Magnificat from St. Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 55. It begins with, Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. Because of her character, humility, and unconditional obedience to God, St. Mary holds the highest place amongst the saints in the church, since it was through her that the divine plan was fulfilled. Thus, at the Third Ecumenical Council of Ephesus, the Fathers reaffirmed her as the Theotokos, the God-bearer. Her womb, more spacious than the heavens, contained the uncontainable one whom the universe could not contain. He drew his human existence from her, and she accompanied him with love and prayer throughout the time of his earthly ministry, even to the foot of the cross. She shared his suffering to the full, bearing his crucifixion and death in the depths of her soul. Accordingly, she is the perfect image of the church, the eternal communion of all those who live and die in Christ. Mary is our model in that she was the first person to receive Jesus Christ. As Mary bore Christ in her womb physically, 
all Christians now have the privilege of bearing God within them spiritually. What we do know about the last years of St. Mary's life on earth are from what church tradition teaches us. All the apostles, with the exception of St. Thomas, since he was preaching in India, were there at her bedside in anticipation of her death. In the blessed company of the apostles, St. Mary breathed her last. One tradition has it that her body was taken up into heaven, and St. Thomas managed to catch a glimpse of her as she was taken up. In proof of this encounter, St. Thomas was given the girdle that St. Mary was using. When the other disciples were astounded that the tomb of St. Mary was found to be empty, it was indeed St. Thomas who gave them the news of her body being taken up into paradise, and he showed them her girdle as evidence. We call it Dormition of St. Mary because we do not believe it was the death of St. Mary, but rather the falling asleep of St. Mary. Death did not have any power over her because she was sanctified, soul and body, by being the Ark of the Covenant, the one who carried our God in her very flesh. The high reverence for St. Mary is portrayed in the hymns of the church, which extol her as the unconsumed burning bush, a second heaven, and the second Eve. In the Old Testament, Moses saw a burning bush that was not consumed. The fire is a symbol of God, and the unconsumed burning bush is a symbol of St. Mary, who carried the fire of divinity in her womb and was not consumed by it. And since Christ took flesh from her, she became like a second heaven, or a dwelling place for God. The dichotomy between St. Mary and Eve contrasts the disobedience and the selfishness of the first Eve to St. Mary's obedience and submission to the will of God as the second Eve. Through the first Eve, humankind fell into sin, and through the second Eve, God enacted His plan to save His creation from the wages of sin. As such, the Church commemorates the Dormition of St. Mary annually with this fast and steadfastly venerates her and beseeches her to intercede on our behalf. By the prayer of your Mother, O God, have pity on us and on our departed. May the memory of Mary be a blessing to us, and may her prayer be a stronghold for our souls.